singing the, the wonderful special. And Lord, we just pray now that uh, we'll preach exactly what you want us to say, for it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Number one, older Paul tells young Timothy to be an example of the believers in the area of word. That's his tongue, the things that are said. Philippians 2.14 says, Do all things without, what, murmurings and disputings. Oh my goodness, some people just want to fight and bicker and argue and debate and dispute. It seems that they're not happy unless they're arguing about something that gets us nowhere. Colossians 3.8 says, put off many things. One of them is filthy communication. There should be no room in, in our vocabulary for curse words, for bad words. We have many different tracks. One of them says God's last name is not a curse word. I can't repeat it from the pulpit. But it's amazing how the world takes our Savior's name in vain and our Heavenly Father's name in vain and blasphemes the God of the universe, the creator of our world, the Savior of our soul. But yet you never hear someone curse Allah or Muhammad and if they do, they better be looking around their back to see who's coming after them. But our Savior's name, our Heavenly Father's name, is blasphemed on a regular basis. I was helping a church out in, in northern Ohio that had lost their pastor and their family, and I was filling in when they couldn't find a replacement. It took them a while to find a pastor. And, and what had happened was very open, very public, and what had happened was this. I'm talking about our words here. Well, the pastor's children got on Facebook, and his children are like 10, 11, 12, 13-ish, and they got on Facebook, and they were telling whoever had their Facebook page what they were doing that day. Some of the members' kids read what the pastor's kids said, and they shot back through Facebook and made fun of the pastor's kids. Well, the pastor's kids got their feelings hurt, so they told their mom, Mrs. Pastor. Well, Mrs. Pastor got on Facebook and shot back to the parents of those member kids saying, your kids hurt my kids' feelings. Well, then the mothers of the members' kids got on Facebook and they shot back to the preacher's wife and they said, not only don't our kids like your kids, but we don't like you. Can you believe that? She turned off the computer, looked back at her husband, said, I will never go back to that church. And you know what? She didn't. He resigned the next Sunday. In two weeks, they had packed up and moved out of state. We need to be so very careful about the words that come out of our mouth. And I'll tell you what, if, if I'm not saved and I live in your community and you invite me to your church and I hear there's all kind of trouble, people getting mad at each other and saying bad things about each other, I'm not coming. I have enough problems during the week, I don't need to come to a church and jump in the middle of their problems. But if I hear that your church is a church that says nice things and is kind and considerate, you know, I just may come this way. I hope that's how you are with the words that proceed out of your mouth. James says we need to be careful because our tongue, even though a small member, can set the, the, the world on fire. The fire of hell, James says. Very, very careful. I hope we use words that are encouraging, and edifying, and I hope in our home, husbands and wives and kids use the same kind of words, make it a fun home to live in. Number two, Paul tells young Timothy to be an example of his conversation. That's his behavior. 1 Timothy 3, 2, preachers are told to be blameless. And certainly if the preachers should be blameless, uh, the members ought to strive for the same thing. Now, there's a lot of areas we can go here. The church I pastor was in right downtown Columbus, Ohio. Uh, it, was, it was really built because of Billy Sunday back in the early 1900s. And uh, the church had started right after the Civil War, but so many people got saved with the Billy Sunday campaign that they tore down the old frame buildings and built huge uh, brick buildings downtown. But the area had gone bad over the years, and now it was a ghetto. We called it the mother of all ghettos. It was as bad as you think Downtown Cincinnati ghetto may be, or wherever one is around here, ours was like a hundred times worse. I could step outside my front door of my office and hand tracks to 20 people, go inside, come out two minutes later, and find 20 new people hand tracks. A crush of people just lived down where our church was, but they're all inner city ghetto. And everybody had overlooked them, or everybody was calling them the L word, loser. I didn't do that. 
I said, this is the ministry God has given me. So I'd go out and I'd shake their hands and I'd hold on and I'd, I'd look past their appearance and I'd look into their eyes, into their soul. You know what I found out? Many of those people had college degrees. Can you imagine that? And they had good families and they had good jobs and lived in a nice area in Columbus and drove nice cars, but they allowed vices to infect their life. And they lost their job, they lost their spouse, they lost their kids, they lost their home, they lost their car, and the only place they could exist was downtown in the ghetto where Central Baptist Church was. Well, because I took time with them and didn't judge them, they came to church, and I gave them the best seat in the house. They didn't know the best seats in the house were down front. I brought them right down front. And because I gave them respect, okay, my behavior towards them was respectful because I gave them that, God opened their heart, they realized who they were, they repented of their sins, accepted Christ, cleaned up their life. Many got reunited with their spouses, with their children, got a good job, moved to a safe part of Columbus, and became great members, all because we showed them respect. Isn't that what Aretha Franklin had that song about, Motown? R-E-S-P-E-C-T? I mean, she made millions off that song. Because if you've ever been disrespected, you know what an awful feeling that is. And Paul tells young Timothy, your outward behavior towards others should be respectful. The golden rule is intact, is it not? And also on the same point, how about the way we cooperate in church? How's our behavior as far as church cooperation goes? You know, my church really grew when people joined me and cooperated. I mean, it's like we all had a tug of war rope, and it's hard to grow a church. Can somebody give me an amen here? It's hard to grow a church, and especially downtown. But we all got on the same side, and sometimes it was slow trudging. I mean, we were barely making any progress, but we were making progress. Then sometimes we just, I just stop, and I'm pulling and pulling. On. What's going on here? I look back, there's some members pulling on the other end of the rope the other way. And I'll tell you what. We need to make sure we cooperate with the pastor and church leadership if you want to see your church grow. I mean, just get on the bandwagon. I mean, I mean let's get the big picture. Let's, let's get the game plan and let's follow it and help the pastor and leadership of the church and watch God grow your church. How's that outward behavior doing? Third of all, Paul says here, you be an example in the area of charity. 1 John 3.18 says, love not in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Now, now charity is simply love in action. Boy, I like that definition. It's love in action. Now, we can talk about a lot of things here. Let me just talk about maybe two. Number one, I want you to know that I had charity and still do to my wife, Cindy. This coming September, we're going to celebrate 43 years. I know I don't look that old. We got married when we were about 10. We started really young. Just seeing if somebody's listening. And I have the same charity towards her today, the same love that I had way back when. And, and I've never raised my fist to my wife. I've never raised my voice, except when I didn't get my way. <laughs> just a joke, just a joke. I never cussed her out, I never screamed, I never denied her money or anything that she needs. You know why? Because I saw how my dad took care of my mom and I saw his example so I figured that's the way it is. So I treated my wife the way my dad treated my mom and I have two boys that are now married and they treat their wives the same way I treat my wife, their mom, the same way my dad treated his wife, my mom. Did you get all that? Examples, that's how it is. And Paul said, have charity, love in action. Man, that's important. Now I'll tell you what, I had charity towards my congregation too. No church is going to let a pastor stay 30 years if they don't feel like he doesn't love them and have that Bible charity. And on the other hand, no pastor is going to stay in a church 30 years if he doesn't feel like the flock doesn't love him back and have charity. And I hope... Pastor Keller and his family feel charity from every single member here back towards them. I want you to know, congregation, my, my church, they, they, they just love me to death. I didn't want to go. They love my wife. My five kids and I have 12 grandkids. And they love my children and love my grandkids and did all kind of great things for them. And, and I felt that. And when times got tough, that's one of the things that kept my compass due north to stay at that church because my congregation had charity back towards me and my family. I kind of look like pastor's family is a gift to the church from God. And we ought to take care of that gift in the same manner. 
Fourth of all, Paul says to young Timothy, you be an example in the area of your spirit. Daniel 6.3 says, Daniel was preferred because an excellent spirit was found in him. You know what the idea behind spirit here? Uh, I'll just kind of boil it down, maybe a little, make it a little bit simpler. It's our attitude. How's your attitude? I have a son-in-law who sells Rico business equipment there in Columbus. And every Monday, tomorrow will be no different, they go in there and the team leader gets on the whiteboard and writes the word attitude up. And he looks at his sales team, he says, if you have a bad attitude, you're not going to sell much, but if you have a good attitude, you're going to sell a lot. My son-in-law came to me and says, isn't that a joke? Isn't that stupid what he said? Then about a month later, he came back, he says, you know what? The boss was right. If I have a bad attitude a certain week, I hardly make any sales. But if I have a positive attitude, a good attitude, a good spirit towards my job, I make a lot of sales. And a lot of times, that's the difference maker in our life, folks, is our outlook, our attitude, our spirit. We had that Christian school all those years, and I used to tell those girls, I'd get them aside. I said, listen, if you're going to marry somebody, you find yourself a Christian boy who has a soft spirit towards the Lord. You, you, you get interested in a boy that's hateful and mean-spirited and got a bad attitude towards his parents and a bad attitude towards church. It's not going to change after you say, I do. You'll be in my office wanting me to pray for that man that he changes, kind of like I feel too late. I told you ahead of time. And it works the other way too, guys. You marry a girl that's, she wants a million dollars the first day, doesn't clean house, got a bad attitude towards everything, it's not going to change when you get married. And I'm, I'm not picking anybody, I really am not. I've just counseled so many husbands and wives and kids, and the number of kids who have bad attitudes towards their parents is unbelievable. I hope that's not you tonight. Maybe we need to have a spirit or an attitude check and see where things go. Now, it's easy to get a bad attitude. I get a bad attitude all the time. You know when I get a bad attitude? When I'm driving, and I get boxed in by these semis, and I got to get somewhere, and I can't get by them, I can't get around them. It seems like they see me, and somehow they always close in on me. It's easy to get a bad attitude, and i, I got, I got to work on that too, so I, I'm not throwing stones at anybody. But how's that spirit? How's that spirit towards your church and things that go on? Paul said, number one, your word. Number two, your conversation. Number three, charity. Number four, your spirit. Number five, he talks about faith here. Philippians 4.19 says, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by the state of Ohio. <laughs> Doesn't say that. How about by the city of Cincinnati? How about, wouldn't it be great if we could just take all of our bills and come down here and lay them on the altar and say, Pastor, you just go ahead and take care of those for us. Doesn't say that at all. It says, uh, we're taken care of ultimately by the Lord. And with the way the economy is, a lot of jobs have left communities. I'm along the Ohio River, and so many of those towns are desperate for work because the businesses have gone belly up or moved to a large city, and, and no longer are those, those weekly or every other week paychecks coming in, and they're really having to trust God, and that's not an easy thing. But if there's one thing I see, there's a lack of faith among Christians today. When Christ went to his hometown and left, remember what the Bible said? He could do no great miracles except heal a few. Why was that? Unbelief. I grew up in Cleveland. I call it the holy city of Ohio. People laugh when I say that. I just kind of do it the bug him, I guess. And uh, I had a friend named Gary, and Gary and I went to the same school. We had the same classes, and Gary wasn't too good in schoolwork. I kind of like school myself. And I would help him with the schoolwork, and, and he would pass. What Gary was good at was working on cars. He had one of those early Mustangs with the 289 engine guys that had a two-barrel carburetor. He took off that two-barrel, put a four-barrel on, and, and ladies, what that means is now twice the amount of gas got into that engine, and we used that four-speed. We'd rip out, we'd toss gravel everywhere up and down his street. And Gary said, Tim, because you helped me with my schoolwork to help me pass, if you get a car, I'll help you fix it. So I went to my dad. Now, Dad 6'3", mom's 4'11". Thanks a lot, Mom! They were at my career as a basketball player. Man, I says, Mom, don't you have anybody on your side that has some tall jeans? She says, no, her dad was 5'2", she's 4'11", so that didn't bode too well for me. Anyway, uh, Dad being as big, Dad had that long arm, and I was full of foolishness and nonsense. I was the second oldest. My older brother Tom was serious about everything. He never did anything wrong. I hated him. No, I didn't hate him. He just was, yeah, he's 
principles. Perfect. Me, I'm always in trouble. I mean, I just... Remember that song, Born to be Wild? Anybody? Come on, I know you know that. That's what I had. I, was, I figured I was born to be wild. And if Dad's long arm hadn't grabbed me back, man, I don't know where I would be. I was used to my dad saying the word no to me all the time. Dad, can I go out with this, the guys here? No. Dad, can I go there? No. Dad, can I go to the dance? No. Dad, can I go out with that girl? No. Dad, I mean, it was no. It was no, 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 no. That's where that song came from. My dad, Phil Labor, she got used to saying no. So I crept in and I says, Dad, it's going to be my senior year. Can I get a car? My dad looked down. He says, why, Timothy, certainly. <gasps> My dad said yes. I couldn't believe it. I think it was the first yes I had in like 17 years of life. And so I said, Dad, when are we going to go get it? He says, we, there's no we. If you want a car, you buy it with the money you've been saving. Dad, all the other parents are buying their kids cars. You're not going to buy me one? He says, nope, and I'm not anybody else's parent. Little did I know that right then at 17 years of age, my dad was teaching me, whether he knew it or not, to stand on my own two feet and take care of myself. And that is translated back to my friend Gary. Uh, this is all connected here, okay? I'm doing good with time here. Gary had an uncle who called Gary and myself over to his shop, and he had a, he had a shop, he had a giant bulldozer that he was tearing down to brass bones. I mean, everything was coming off. The front blade, the back shovel, all these hydraulic hoses, rings, pistons, everything that held that thing together, he had it torn down, and it was everywhere in his garage. And he held up the key, he says, boys, you come back in a week, and we'll start her up the first time. You know what we did? Ha <laughs> ha, yeah, right! That wasn't going to happen. I had worked on cars with my friend. It took forever to fix the car. He had a giant bulldozer completely ripped down to nothing. And he was going to start that in a week. Oh, yeah. We couldn't wait to go back and see this old geezer, the look of bewilderment on his face when that didn't start. Now, we didn't tell him that because my dad taught me to be respectful, but we talked and we just laughed. What's wrong with this guy? He thinks he can start that. Well, Needless to say, he called us the next week, and we got my friend's Mustang, and we, we hot-rodded all the way over, spinning out, throwing gravel everywhere. We pulled up, put the brake on, went inside, and we're just laughing. We can't wait to see this guy's face. We went in. He was sitting up in that bulldozer, and we looked up. He says, boys, should we give it a start? And we're just elbowing each other. We're just laughing our full heads off. See, to me, everything was funny. Gary and I could be in a class, and there wasn't anything going on. We just look at each other. We start to laugh. We didn't know why. It's just teenager foolishness. And so we're, we're just kind of trying to keep this laughter inside of us, waiting for that thing not to start. He put the key in. He turned it once, and the engine roared. We said, turn it off. It's hurting our ears. So he turned it off, pulled out the key, and he looked down at two foolish teenage boys. He said, boys... You didn't think that was going to start, did you? We looked up and said, no. He looked back down. He says, you want to know why? We said, yeah. He says, because you didn't have any faith. If there's one thing I see as I travel our state for the last five years in surrounding states, there's a lack of faith that is crippling our churches because people are not living by faith. Remember I mentioned Christ, only two small miracles, heal a few people because of unbelief? Well, you know what that taught me? Little faith produces little miracles. Big faith produces big miracles. Someone may say, I want to have big faith. How do I get it? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. As we get in it and study and memorize and meditate and live it, God will increase our shoulders of faith. Hey. Do you have enough faith to believe that God will fill your church up? Do you really have? You say, well, <laughs> yes, I do. I'm in churches everywhere. Do, does this church collectively and individually have faith that God can fill this place up to his glory? That's faith. Do you have faith that that wayward child can come back or that unsaved spouse? See, we're talking about that type of faith that is absolutely life-changing for individuals, for families, and for churches. Faith! For my last point, you may all say amen. <laughs> my last point, 
older Paul tells young Timothy to be example in purity. Now I have about 15 verses down here about purity. I'll just read you one. 1 Timothy 5.22, Paul tells Timothy, keep himself pure. You know, it's our job, it's our responsibility to keep ourselves pure. Very important. Now I'll tell you, the day and age we live, it's hard for our young people with all the temptations that are out there. Wow, I just, I just cringe when I see all the temptations that can destroy a young person's purity. And remember, old Paul's telling young Timothy, you set the example in all these areas, the last one being purity. In Columbus, one of the public high schools, a couple years ago, the boys were in the back of the classroom, carrying on, just laughing. The teacher went back to see what it was, and he grabbed the cell phone. Now, see, when I was growing up, we didn't have cell phones, kids. No cell phones, nothing. Uh, none of that jazz. The closest thing I got to a cell phone when I was growing up was looking at Dick Tracy in the comic section talking into his wristwatch. That was about it. Anyway, the teacher went back to see if the boys were laughing about. He grabbed the cell phone, and I'm in mixed company. I'll be as discreet as I can. The girls in that class had sent some immoral pictures of themselves to the boys over the cell phone. By uh, public uh, school policy in the city of Columbus, the teacher took those girls down to the principal's office, and by state law, I believe, one of my sons is a policeman, I believe I'm right here, they had to call Columbus Public Police and Children's Services. They came down, they handcuffed those girls that had sent those immoral pictures, took them downtown, fingerprinted them, and were about to label them as sexual predators for life. Until cooler heads prevailed, the girls got a slap on the wrist, a stern talking to, community service, with the promise they'd never do anything like that again. Folks, I didn't face all that as a teenager growing up, and our young people face that today. When's the last time you took that cell phone and, seen, and have seen where your child, your teenager has been? Who he's texted, the pictures have gone out. You say, I don't know how to do that, then find somebody that does and check it out. I'll tell you what, when I knew my dad checked out all my stories, I made sure I, I led a clean life because I knew my dad was checking those things out. Growing up in Cleveland, I think... And some, some, you can challenge me after the service if you want. I think I had the best childhood of any kid in the history of planet Earth. I had the best childhood growing up. Oh, my goodness. My folks had good jobs. They were both Christians. We went to church all the time, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday. Had a great youth group. And I'll tell you what, I think because of that era, when I stood down at the altar at age 20, my wife stood in the back at age 19, we were both virgins when we got married. Neither one of us had ever known another person. Now, I'm not bragging about that. That's just, just the way it was in my era up there in Cleveland. In fact, our whole youth group was that way. Everybody just lived a pure life because it was taught from the pulpit, it was taught in our youth group, and it was taught at the house. I mean, I had a great life. I didn't mess around in all these other areas that kids do today. In fact, it's summer. I never slept till 1 o'clock in the afternoon because I'd been up all, all night playing video games or texting or whatever. You say, well, what did you do? When the sun came up, guess what I did? I got up. You say, what did you do when you got up? I went outside and played. I climbed trees. Oh, I love to climb trees. We'd build tree forts, and we'd throw crab apples and mud pies at kids down the road who built their tree fort. And when I got thirsty, I'd drink out of the creek. And when I got hungry, I'd pick blackberries. And when the sun went down, I went home. And you know what I did when I went home? I went to bed because I was wore out. And the next day, it was all over. Now, if you, if, if you make a kid go outside, they think you're punishing them. To me, if my parents would have made me stay in, I would have felt like that was punishment. And when I came home, guess what? If mom was watching TV, I watched what she watched. You know what she watched? I Love Lucy. Pretty good. And if dad was watching TV, I watched what dad watched. Remember Chuck Connors and the Rifleman? Man, alive. I used to love that. I mean, good, wholesome shows that build family core values. You don't see that today. I mean, every once in a while, we'd see Tarzan, and I'd go around school, ah, if you don't know what that is, talk to your parents. They'll help you figure that out. Anyways, my wife and I got married. That's just the way it was. And it wasn't that I didn't like girls. Man, I love girls. I had it worse for girls than maybe anybody else I knew. I mean, my hormones were jumping everywhere. I mean, every girl I saw, I wanted to give them a hug. Every girl I saw, I wanted to kiss. I don't care if they were tall, short, fat, skinny, pimples, warts. Buck teeth, no teeth, I'd gum them. I 
took the deacon's daughter out. My dad got down that. He had a big nose. He stuck his nose right in my nose. He said, son, you taking out the deacon's daughter? He said, yep, dad, I am. He said, son, you going to kiss her? Dad, she's not going to be able to help herself. That's, that's going to happen. My dad said, if I hear you lay one hand on her, I'll kill you. Now, I wanted to kiss the deacon's daughter really bad, but I wanted to live worse. So I didn't. In fact, we both took different cars and we waved at each other. That's just the way it was. Different era than today. My dad said, hey, son, you get married, men go home to their wives and children after work. They don't all go out to the bars or the honky-tonks. And by the way, ladies, if you're working, you go home to your husbands and children after work too. I think it was Bob Jones Sr. said, when the church loses her power, excuse me, when the church loses her purity, she loses her power. And sometimes that's what happens in our personal lives, in our greater church family's life, when we don't have that power, maybe the purity motive or question should be talked about. I'm glad I had a pure life. And, and to the guys, I, I, I can't speak for the girls, I don't know. To the teenage guys, I'm no different than you. You're no different than me. But Paul told Timothy to what? Be an example in the area of purity and to flee youthful lust. That's what you're going to have to do and be a real component of this church and your youth group to be everything that God wants you to be. Older Paul's telling young Timothy, you be an example in six areas of their life, of his life. And as far as I know, Timothy was an example in all those areas. How about ourselves tonight? How's your example? You see, you're either leading people to live a better life or you're becoming a stumbling block. We're, we're one of the two. Personally, I want to lead a life so people can get higher and closer to the Lord and be that example. Let's pray. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed, no one looking around. If you're here tonight and you'll say, Brother Lapish, I am not a born-again Christian. I need to be saved. Would you pray for me? Let's lift up your hand for salvation. Someone, I need to be saved. If you're here tonight and maybe the Holy Spirit of God, think about that, the Holy Spirit of God was talking to you about some area of your life. It may have been something completely different than I talked about tonight, but if you felt like God spoke to you about something tonight, would you put your hand up real quick and put it down? Yes, I see down front. Thank you. Somebody else. About being the right kind of example. Our Heavenly Father, we ask that you bless this invitation. We'll give Christ all the honor and glory, for it's in his name I pray. Amen. Shall we all stand and turn to what number? 445, I'll stand up here for one verse, then I will turn the service over to Brother...